All right. Hey, everyone. <clears throat> Good to see you. Um, this may be the last time, as far as plans go, it will be the last time that I teach from this spot in this house because uh, we've started the move to Beulah. Been moving for the last two days. And um, we're not moving a, a lot of furniture because we got new furniture, but there are some pieces of furniture that are moving. And those are scheduled to be moved Friday, which would include this chair that I'm sitting in. So um, I'll still be living here, actually, until mid-December. I'll just have to find another place to teach from because there won't be a chair here. Or I'll have to sit on the floor. <laughs> we'll see. There's a bed over there. I might be able to sit on the bed. Um, but welcome uh, to Seven Steps to Awakening and Out of the Stillness. Um, today, we are going to begin with, quote, 345. And this is what 345 says in the Seven Steps to Awakening. When self-knowledge arises and the object ceases to be, the seer is realized as the soul reality. When self-knowledge arises and the object ceases to be, the seer is realized as the soul reality. And one thing that, of course, stands out to me in this particular quote is that it doesn't just say when self-knowledge arises. It says when self-knowledge arises and the object ceases to be. And I think that's important because I think that's experiential. I think that we can confuse uh, our intellectual knowledge of the self um, and even our, our experience of the self that we may have through meditation uh, but, but not permanent, you know, right? That we experience it during meditation, but then maybe we get back into the day, back into the world, and 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 we're not experiencing it anymore. We're back to experiencing ourself as the personal self, right? I think we can confuse either the intellectual knowledge or the um, intermittent experience of the self uh, with awakening. Um, but this is making it very, very clear that the object ceases to be, right? In other words, all there is is the self. There's not I and something else, right? All there is is the self. So it's kind of nice to have that very clear criteria that then the seer is realized as the sole reality. You know, that's a very deep penetrating realization far beyond intellectual and even beyond intermittent direct experiences of the self. When self-knowledge arises and the object ceases to be, the seer is realized as the soul reality. So I'm just going to look at how I contemplated this and out of the stillness. Here's what I wrote. The world is a distraction from what is real. The perceiving thinker is distraction too. When self-realization occurs, distractions lose their attraction value. And that's hyphenated as one word, attraction value. Because in the light of reality, they are seen to be unreal. While they are still assumed to be real, their attraction value is strong. Minimize the attraction value of distraction by choosing to remember what is real. Use whatever remembrance you have. It is enough to be helpful. And I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to stay on this briefly and then move on to the next one, which is actually related. Um, but I think that we can all uh, recognize that when there's still this subconscious belief that the world is real, then the attraction 
of the world, the attraction to thoughts about the world is very strong, right? I mean, uh, how many of us have had the experience of being in meditation or contemplation or both in the morning and having such clarity, just like, oh my God, clarity. And then by two in the afternoon, it's completely gone, <laughs> right? We're completely wrapped up in the world again. We're feeling all of the emotions that we typically feel. Uh, you know, it's just, it seems like that was a lifetime ago, the clarity of the morning. And that's because the attraction value of the world is strong as long as the subconscious belief in the world exists. And it's helpful to know that because, it, you know, one thing, at least one thing I have found helpful, and I've seen other pe people teach this as well. So maybe it's not helpful just for me. Maybe it's helpful for everyone. What seems to be helpful is to call it as it is, uh, call it as it is. And what I mean by that is if I am getting caught up in, in the world, whether it's my personal life, whether it's what's going on in the news, it doesn't really matter. But if I'm getting caught up in the world, notice that, look right at what's going on and say, this is happening because the attraction to the world is strong as long as the subconscious belief in the world still exists. So that's calling it as it is. One thing that I learned is that, uh, well, and you guys all know this, <laughs> Look how smart I am. One thing I learned is that the ego tells stories. <laughs> you all know that. But but here's what I learned about those stories that's really important. What, what the ego's stories are doing is they're distracting us from the truth of the situation. You know, like uh, the ego is like uh, a, a magician. And what a magician does is in order to make the magic trick happen is they know exactly how to get you to look in one place while not looking in another place, right? They know exactly how to direct your attention. That's what the ego does. And that's what these stories are. These stories are there to direct your attention away from what's really going on. And through distraction, then you believe in the illusion, right? I mean, that's exactly what the magician is having you do. Through distraction, the illusion looks real. Same thing with the ego. Through distraction, the illusion looks real. So our job is to not be distracted. And what that means is we learn to call things. The, the wording I was taught by Holy Spirit was call it by its name. But you're calling things as they are. So, uh, for example, let's say you're you're having an argument with someone. And uh, you're able to pause and look and notice that the reason you are upset right now is because this person said something that triggered your, your sense of unworthiness, right? That's the real reason you're upset right now. Then you say that to yourself. You don't have to say it out loud, but you say to yourself, the only reason I'm upset right now is because I believe I'm unworthy. You call it by its name. When you're not calling it by its name, you're saying, well, I'm upset because she he did this and he did this. And see, that's the distraction. So the story is the distraction. And our job is to look for the truth of what's going on and to, and to focus on that truth. So what this is telling us is the reason, you know, by two o'clock in the afternoon, we can't even remember the clarity of the morning. We're not even thinking about the clarity of the morning. We're totally caught up in whatever's going on in the world. The reason that is true is because the attraction value of the world is strong as long as the subconscious belief that it's real still exists. So, you know, what, what a lot of spiritual students will do, or maybe all of us at one time or another, is just say, uh, I suck as a spiritual student because by two o'clock in the afternoon, I've forgotten the morning. That's not the truth. You see, that's the ego's distraction. The ego is getting you to believe you suck as a spiritual student <laughs> when the truth is the attraction value of the world is strong as long as the subconscious belief that it's real is still here. 
You know, so this is what's going on here. I got caught up because the attraction value is strong as long as this belief is here. And the more we call things by their name or the more we call it as it is, the closer we're going to get to truth realization because we are not falling for the illusions tricks or the illusionists tricks. So I'll read 345 again. <clears throat> the world is a distraction from what is real. The perceiving thinker is distraction too. In other words, all of your thoughts, all of those stories are part of the illusionist's tricks. The world is a distraction from what is real. The perceiving thinker is distraction too. When self-realization occurs, distractions lose their attraction value because in the light of reality, they are seen to be unreal. While they are still assumed to be real, there's the subconscious belief, right? While they are still assumed to be real, their attraction value is strong. Minimize the attraction value of distractions by choosing to remember what is real. So call it by its name. Say what it is, right? This is why I'm caught up in the world. This is why I'm angry right now. This is why I'm afraid right now. And this is where that root cause inquiry comes in helpful. Um, root cause inquiry is getting you down to what's really going on. So you can say, ah, that's what's going on. Uh, some people have the misperception that root cause inquiry is supposed to make them feel better. Maybe sometimes it does, who knows, but maybe sometimes it actually makes you feel way, way worse because you're bringing out the, the truth about what's going on, which is that you think you're the lowest scum on the planet earth. That doesn't feel good, right? <laughs> But now you can put your awareness on what's really going on. See, that's what matters. Now you can say, this is what's really going on. You know, I'm not trying to avoid this because, you know, a person like me shouldn't have to do that. I'm trying to avoid it because I am somehow afraid that if I attempt it, people are going to see how useless and unworthy I am. That's what's going on here. And, you know, it, it's amazing because uh, I'm going to use the term over time, you know, maybe sometimes miraculously, spontaneously, but I would have to say that most of my experience is over time. Over time, calling something by its name or being honest about what's really going on here, putting awareness on the real problem instead of the story, corrects it or heals it. You know, but but having your awareness distracted by the illusionist does not help. So minimize the attraction value of distractions by choosing to remember what is real. Use whatever remembrance you have. It is enough to be helpful. All right, I'm going to move right into 346. 346 in the seven steps to awakening says, it is the mind that makes things appear here. It brings about the appearance of the body, etc. Not else is aware of the body. <laughs> and of course, if I had written that, I would have said nothing else, nothing but the mind is aware of the body, right? Nothing else, not else is aware of the body. It is the mind that makes things appear here. It brings about the appearance of the body, etc. Not else is aware of the body. So let's look at 346 and out of the stillness. The body and the world appear real, but that is because mind makes it seem so. Minimize the belief. And I want to say here, Again, I mean, I've said it, but some things are worth saying over and over and over again. When we're saying that the mind believes in the world, we aren't actually talking about the intellectual thought as much as the subconscious mind. Certainly, most people out there, intellectual thought believes in the world too. But, you know, once you're a spiritual student, 
you can say, I don't believe in the world anymore. That doesn't mean shit. Because the mind that believes in the world is subconscious. We're not saying you read it in a book and now you can just say, I don't believe in it. I remember there was one person I knew um, who, of course, believed she didn't believe in the world <laughs> um, and didn't believe in the body. And she was from New Zealand. And apparently in New Zealand, they don't have poison ivy. She had never even heard of poison ivy. And she came to visit me in North Carolina and went walking about in my backyard. There was plenty of poison ivy out there. <laughs> she, I guess, got you know into it and she got covered in poison ivy. And, and when I told her what was happening, that she had caught poison ivy, she said, I, that can't be true. She said, I can't catch poison ivy because I don't believe in it. She goes, I never even heard of it. See, she was thinking the conscious mind. The belief in the world is in the subconscious mind. And it, you know, and if you believe in the world, you believe in the world. And poison, you know, you don't have to know about poison ivy at an intellectual level to catch poison ivy. Right. So, so when this says that the mind makes the world and the body seem real, it's referring to the subconscious mind. And that's why our spiritual practices are helpful because the, the good spiritual practices that we learn are actually working on the subconscious mind. You see, not the intellectual mind. So the body and the world appear real, but that is because mind makes it seem so. Minimize the belief in mind made illusion by choosing to remember what is real and what is not. Now, this is all the same as what the previous entry said in Out of the Stillness, but now it's going to talk about a way to live this, a way to practice this. Live your choice by practicing equanimity. Practice equanimity by watching while withholding reaction. Withhold reaction because you do not want to give the unreal the value of the real. So there's three really important steps there. And in fact, if you ignore any of those steps, you could do this wrong. And what I mean by wrong is that you could repress, right? Or, or you could believe and totally act out from your anger, right? So in order to do this right, and by right, I mean in a way that it's healing the subconscious, you need to follow all three steps. So let's look at the first step. The first step to practicing equanimity is by watching while withholding reaction. So what that means is I am really, really pissed at you right now. And what I really want to do is tell you what a bitch you are, <laughs> right? But I am going to watch that anger energy in me without opening my mouth, without telling you what a bitch you are. In other words, I'm not going to act on it. I'm just going to watch it be here. I'm also clearly not going to deny it and pretend like it's not there to myself, right? I'm just going to watch it. I'm going to allow it to be, but it's going to be there as my own personal private show, not as something that I spit out on the world. And in fact, I, I, I can't remember what teacher, it might be Stephen Mitchell, it might be Stephen Mitchell in the other, in the untethered soul. Is that Stephen Mitchell? I get my people mixed up nowadays. No, who is the untethered soul? Michael Singer. Yeah. Not Stephen Mitchell, Michael Singer. <laughs> Those are the same uh, uh, initials just flipped, right? <laughs> that's why they're connect. That's why they're connected in my brain. <laughs> okay, so Michael Singer. Um, it might be Michael Singer that talks about how when you act on something, you give it much more power, right? When you act on it, you give it much more power. So, uh, and in fact, we'll see that as we move forward in the steps. The reason we're not acting on it then is because we don't want to give it any more power than it already has, right? So the first step is to practice equanimity 
by, while withholding reaction. Practice equanimity by watching while withholding reaction. That's a lot of W's. Practice equanimity by watching while withholding reaction. However, that step alone by itself without the other two steps could be repression. And that's why the other two steps are really important. Withhold reaction. Am I doing this right? Live your choice by practicing equanimity. Practice equanimity by watching while withholding reaction. Withhold reaction because you do not want to give the unreal the value. So the first step was really just practice equanimity, right? Live your choice by practicing equanimity. The second step is you practice equanimity by watching while withholding your reaction. Okay, the third step, withhold reaction because, this is very important, because you do not want to give the unreal the value of the real. In other words, I am not withholding my reaction because if I react, that means I'm bad. That is not my reason. If that is my reason for withholding my reaction, I'm actually reinforcing the subconscious I am bad belief. So this is all about the subconscious. So I am not withholding my reaction because I'm bad if I react. And I would say this is the number one mistake that spiritual students make when they learn that it's better to withhold your reaction. They withhold it for the wrong reason. And you know you can't lie to the subconscious about your reason? You can't. So you have to do it for the right reason. And the right reason for withholding that reaction is, I do not want to give the unreal the value of real. That's why I'm doing it. See, that's teaching the subconscious a completely different lesson. So the three steps, I messed that up a little bit, but that's okay. You guys can follow. The three steps, number one is simply live by practicing equanimity. The next two steps tell us how to do that. To practice equanimity, you watch while withholding any reaction. And of course, you know, this is talking, of course, about egoic reactions, right? In fact, uh, one thing I learned at one point was to see reactions as egoic and responses as spirit. So like, it's okay to respond, but you don't want to react. That's kind of the way the language went in my head, right? A response is coming from spirit. A reaction is coming from ego. And then the reason I'm withholding my reaction is because I do not want to give the unreal the value of real. Now, when you withhold your reaction, of course, uh, it doesn't mean, I mean, it, it said watching, right? Watching. So it doesn't mean that you're pretending like you're not feeling this, that you're pretending like these thoughts aren't here. It doesn't mean you're lying to yourself. You're being 100% honest with yourself about what the egoic, you know, reaction is. It's just that you're watching it instead of acting from it. And that's really the rest, accept, and trust process that it's talking about. Uh I want to say even to this day, but I'm not sure it's as true as it was a year ago. <laughs> so even to this day, especially a year ago. <laughs> um, the way I word it is the number of times that I bit my tongue per day, people would never have been able to guess. And what I mean by bit my tongue is that I saw an egoic thought to say something and I chose not to. Uh, the difference is uh, it, it became much more peaceful and much easier to do. 
right? Where in the beginning, there may have been lots of emotions and, and, and I had to go rest, accept and trust. And I had to go journal. And But even a year ago, there were still a number of times in interaction with people that there would be this thought that would arise that I could identify as egoic. And that's something else that got easy and fast is identifying it as egoic, right? I could identify as egoic and therefore I would not say it or do it if it was a thing to do. In my memory, it was more a thing to say. This year, uh, I haven't noticed as many egoic thoughts, which is why I said not as much this year. I would still, obviously, when an egoic thought shows up, I would still bite the tongue for the right reasons. Uh, but I'm not seeing as many. Uh, what's happening this year is I feel much, much, much more empty than ever before. In fact, we have a an exercise this month, the ministers do, um, that that we are watching, you know, when the ego is really there and interpreting a situation, we kind of stop and ask ourselves, you know, what would this experience be without these thoughts? And we try and look at the same experience without the thoughts. I've genuinely had a challenge with the uh, exercise because what I'm noticing is that there isn't a ton of egoic chatter about what's going on. It's just, this is happening. And so I'm, this is how I'm responding, not reacting. This is happening now. And so this is how, and I'm just kind of taking things as they come. Um, even a year ago, I think there still would have been more necessary discernment than there is now. Um, but that discernment got to where it was very, very easy to do. In the beginning, it's not. Uh, kind of reminds me of the saying, practice makes perfect, right? Um, but when we live in equanimity, the way it's been described, when we live in equanimity, we are living from the peace of the self, the P-E-A-C-E, -E, of course, the peace of the self to the best of our be uh, ability without being moved from that peace. So we're living as the self. Now, what's interesting about that is, you know, something could happen and all of these emotions could arise. You all know that you can't, in, a, in an authentic way, make emotions stop. If you're making emotions stop, you're actually going deeper into ego. You're repressing, right? There is no, hear this loudly. There is no authentic way to make emotions stop. Did you guys hear that? You know, they just are as they are. <laughs> yeah, it looks like Melissa like that. They just are as they are, right? So the way that you live the peace of the self, oh, he's up there ringing the doorbell. I told him I'd be down here teaching, just let himself in. We'll see if he figures out that I really meant what I said. <laughs> Somebody's coming over to use my washer and dryer. Um, if not, he'll sit on the porch for a while, I guess. Um, the best, you know, I told you to live the peace of the self to the best of your ability. Living the peace, the P-E-A-C-E -E of the self to the best of your ability does not mean only feeling peace. Living the peace of the self to the best of your ability means that when this other stuff comes up, you watch it without reacting from it. I'm wondering if I should go up there and let him in. Should we go let him in instead of making him sit on the porch for however long he'd sit on the porch? Of course, he might read 346 again, and then we will move on. The body and the world appear real, but that is because mind makes it seem so. Minimize the belief in mind-made illusion by choosing to remember what is real and what is not. Live your choice by practicing equanimity. Practice equanimity by watching while withholding reaction. 
withhold reaction because remember this step is important or you're teaching the subconscious the wrong wrong lesson right withhold reaction because you do not want to give the unreal the value of real and again that doesn't mean repress anything it means watch it so we are moving on to number 356. Number 356 in the seven steps to awakening says, such indeed is the nature of this utter ignorance, this delusion and this world process without real existence. There is this illusory notion of egotism. This egotism does not exist in the infinite self. In the infinite self, there is no creator, no creation, no worlds, no heaven, no humans, no demons, no bodies, no elements, no time. Yeah, I'll read that one more time and then we'll look at the journal. Such indeed is the nature of this utter ignorance, this delusion, and this world process. Without real existence, there is this illusory notion of egotism. This egotism does not exist in the infinite self. In the infinite self, there is no creator, no creation, no worlds, no heaven, no humans, no demons, no bodies, no elements, no time. And if you know my four principles of God, then what he is talking about, of course, when he says that there is um, no egotism in the self, he, of course, is referring to the first principle of God. And that all of these things that he's saying does not exist. There is no creator. That would be the third principle of God. Even that doesn't exist. There's no creation, no worlds, no heaven, no humans, no demons, no bodies, no elements, no time. That's all the fourth principle of God. That does not exist. In other words, from the perspective of the first principle of God, all there is is the first principle of God. Right? And again, Ms. Argadotta has told us this, that even the second principle of God is illusion. Right. So in a nutshell, that's what this particular quote says. Let's look and see how I contemplated that. So number 356 in Out of the Stillness. I, the personal self, seems to be the center of all I see and all I experience. I, the personal self, is even the center of this experience called awakening, or we could say of this spiritual path, right? That's really what that means in this sentence. Everything, including the world and this path of awakening, is interpreted, experienced, and understood through the personal self. What is this personal self? This filter of everything. Is it so right that its interpretations should be seen as fact or are they fantasy? Isn't this self, which I call I, part of the fantasy house of mind? What is wisdom? Continuing to trust and believe everything this I says? or abandoning it, abandoning it. Um, this is a contemplation that I contemplated many, many times, not always with the exact same words, but always the exact same spirit of the contemplation. Because for some reason, every single one of us, every single one of us, as long as we're attached to that personal lie, um, thinks that we are right. 
you know, it's just built into that personal eye. We think that we are right. I mean, I suppose that comes from having the personal eye be the center of everything, right? Each one of us are the center of the universe. <laughs> um, and, and we think that based on our experience and our interpretation and our judgments, that somehow we are right about everything. And this is uh, very deeply embedded into the subconscious. It's another thing that's at the subconscious level. So one thing I did to um, affect that subconscious belief is often multiple, 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 multiple times I would contemplate in some way uh, and when I first started contemplating, there were 6 billion people on the planet. Now I hear there's like 8 billion, I'm like, wow, how could that be? Right. <laughs> so I had to change the number. Uh, we'll stick with the middle. We'll say 7 billion because I'm sharing a contemplation that's been here for many, many years. There are 7 billion people on the planet. This is one out of 7 billion points of view. Why do I think this one is right? I mean, if, if you just keep asking the question, you'll see that it's ludicrous. And yet every one of us has that I'm right built in. And so we need to inquire and chip away at it. And for me, what I found very helpful because it dawned every time I asked the question, it dawned how ludicrous it was to think I was right when I would say there are 6 billion people or 7 billion or now 8 billion people on the planet. Out of all of those 8 billion, why do I think I'm right? I'm right. And I don't even know the number before, right? If you subtract one from 8 billion, whatever that number is, that would be 7,999,999,999. Is that right? <laughs> Something like that. Why do I think all those people are wrong and I'm right? You see how friggin' ridiculous that is? So just asking this inquiry over and over and over and over again, help me to see that points of view are merely that points of view. You know, there's two ways to say it. It's kind of like Nizar Gadada said, either everything's a miracle or nothing is. You could say either um, everyone's wrong or everyone's right, but you, you know, they're right from their point of view, right? <laughs> they're either wrong because they only have a limited point of view or they're right from their point of view. And if I had their point of view, I'd see like they do. But you can't say I'm the most right, which is a subconscious belief in every one of us. That's a part of the egotism. So what happened when I was contemplating this quote, which I don't even know yet if I had realized the four principles of God when I was here, I, uh, contemplating this quote, I did realize the four principles of God in 2012 while contemplating the seven steps to awakening. What I don't have a distinct memory of is which quote was I contemplating, exactly where was I? So maybe I already knew it, maybe I didn't. And I can also tell you that when the four principles of God clicked in it was quite fuzzy in and out in and out in and out for a while right in fact i don't even know what year i first told you all about it but it wasn't right away because i had to allow that clarity to deepen and become more consistent it was very very shifting and very very slippery in the beginning but my guess is when i read this particular quote which is very clearly talking about the the first and, and fourth principles of God. Um, I probably did not have that clarity in reading the quote. So I probably could not have contemplated it from that clarity. 
And so what really happened was I really focused on the no humans and translated that to personal self. And I'm looking at there are no humans and yet this human, this personal self is the filter of everything I experience. How bizarre is that? Can you see what an interesting contemplation that is? There's no such thing as a human. And yet, this personal self, this mind, memory, experience, personality, preferences, values, whatever is all here that makes up the personal self is the filter for everything. Like There's nothing that I see that I don't see through that. And so I just focused on that part of the contemplation. And this is where, again, I came in. How can it be right if it's only one of, at that time, maybe 7 billion? How can it be right? And, and that is a stepping stone towards seeing that there is no personal self. So, you know, this very much reminds me of Awakening Together's core values. Because Awakening Together's core values say a couple of, well, it says a lot of things, but a couple of things are jumping out at me now. One is that we each follow our own guidance and we allow each one to be where they are. So when we contemplate a quote, you know, here's, several words and it looks like i contemplated two of them because based on where i was on the time at the time and based on what is really useful to me which was undoing this personal self especially undoing that i am right that was a, a fruitful contemplation for me and I guess I'm going to get on a high horse here because I see other thoughts coming about contemplation. So we're going to we're going to take it a little side here about contemplation. Some of the mistakes that people make when they're contemplating, contemplating, even contemplating the seven steps to awakening. You know, I've heard people say this. Um, you know, people will say things like every one of these quotes are the same. There's nothing new in any of these quotes. Right. Or, or sometimes people will look at a quote and say, I, I don't believe that there is a world. <laughs> when you judge the quote, you cannot contemplate it. So the trick is to look at a quote and just say, what is here for me? And if your eyes happen to go to two words out of 50, and you feel to contemplate those two words deeply, that's perfect. I think in this book, I think Michael Langford even recommends after going through the entire book that you start over again. And that's because he knows that your first time through, you'll be at, let's say, a certain level, and you're only going to be able to see and contemplate the quotes from that level. But as you contemplate, your level will shift. And so the second time you go through the book, you're going to see the quotes differently. And you're going to be able to contemplate them at a different level. So, um, so what we're looking at here is just an example of where I did that. I didn't really have an understanding of the quote at all, but I still found something in it that was useful to me. Right. And that, that's just a bit that in itself is a very important lesson. Um. <laughs> oh my goodness I just got a text from mom somebody delivered computers to her house and she wants to know if I order them of course I didn't so I'll, I'll talk to her about that later but somebody misdelivered some computers to her house isn't that funny I just want to share a mistake that I heard recently uh, I'm going to go ahead and share it while I'm here just because it, it's important um Michael Langford, if you read uh, 
the most direct means to eternal bliss or the direct means to eternal bliss, either one. He talks about how the ego wants to distort the teachings. Uh, recently, I heard someone distort the teachings. And I want to tell you exactly why this person distorted the teachings, because any of us could do it, right? The person distorted the teachings because the teaching as they were written, that person judged themselves against the teaching, found themselves lacking. For example, let's go with the equanimity one. Let me just make up a story. It will be more clear. We just looked at this quote about equanimity, and we looked at this quote that said, or actually uh, out of the stillness journal entry that said, um, the way to live equanimity is to watch while withholding your reaction. Well, let's say you can remember five times in the last three days when you did not withhold your reaction, <laughs> right? So what, what will happen then often is that the self-judgment will kick in, right? This You're not good enough. You, you understand that, right? That's what happens with the self-judgment. You're not good enough. And so then what happened was this particular person changed the meaning of the teaching in order to feel better. So this quote doesn't really mean that you should withhold your reaction. You know, be, what this quote really means is, uh, you know, you can react, but you have to be honest with yourself about why you reacted, right? <laughs> That's not what it says. So we want to be careful when our own judgment of ourself causes us to distort the teachings. Let me show you guys an attitude that's helpful, because guess what? None of us are perfect, and we're all far, 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 far from it when we start. Do you agree? <laughs> Whatever the heck perfect means. But we're all far, far, far from it when we start. So here's a helpful way of looking at a quote like that. So if you look at a quote that says, you know, to practice watching without reacting. And you know that you react. Instead of judging yourself, you say, ah, there's something for me to learn. There's a new goal for me to work towards. So I am now going to start trying to do that. And I know it's going to be a brand new habit. I know it's going to take time. I know I'm going to slip but I am going to remain focused on trying to learn this until I notice that not reacting has become natural. And it doesn't matter if that takes two years, three years, five years, 10 years, it's worth it. But you don't pretend like the teaching didn't say what it said. You see, if you pretend like the teaching didn't say what it said, you are robbing yourself of the opportunity to expand right to go beyond where you're at and i know i've told you all this before although it may have been many many years but i know i have said it before um one of the greatest hindrances to positive spiritual practice is the i am bad belief so watch for that watch when are you not practicing the way you would if 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 you had no I am bad belief, if all, all you wanted to do was awaken more, right? Are there things you're not trying because you've decided in advance you're going to fail? Are there things you're not doing because you've already decided you'll never be good at it? See, that's how the I am bad belief holds you back. You see that? So just pretend like it didn't exist. If I couldn't even have the idea that I'm not good at meditation, like if I couldn't even have that idea, would I try to meditate? You know, just pretend like you don't have it and see what you feel. But be aware of avoiding teachings, distorting teachings, cha you know, changing teachings because of the I am bad belief. So there, now I'm off my high horse. All that stuff just started coming, so it got shared. But it, it's really helpful, especially what I just said about the, the I am bad, bad belief is not at all true about you, not at all true about you, and yet one of your greatest obstacles at the same time. 
So you have to be aware of it and you have <laughs> very strong language here, but please forgive me. I'm setting the goal. <laughs> you have to learn not to believe it when it shows up. Don't be so quick to believe that you're a loser. Don't be so quick to believe that you'll never be good enough. Don't be so quick to believe you can never get it right or, or, or whatever form that shows up in your mind. Now we're back to where we started. Call it by its name. Ah, that is the I am bad belief. Just call it by its name. We are so quick to believe it. And if you think about it, it's not even logical. Why would we be so quick to believe something that's telling us we're a pile of shit? You know, why? <laughs> like, it's not even logical. And yet we do it. So start trying to notice it for what it is. Notice how it's getting in your way. And then just pretend if I didn't think I would fail, would I try? If I didn't think I would never be able to do it would I want to at least walk in that direction and, and then see what arises, right? And if a yes arises, then do it anyway, in spite of what the I am bad belief is saying. But don't be afraid of high bar goals. Don't be afraid of them. It may take years, but they're worth it. I mean, do you really want the masters to set low bar goals for you? Is that why you're here? No, you want the high bar goals. That's what you want. So don't be afraid of them. Just work in that direction in whatever way you can. All right, we have five minutes left. I'm gonna jump over to 358. I don't even know this word. The power of, somebody can unmic and tell me how to say it. Is it nescience? Is that how you say this word? Okay, Anne is giving me a yes. The power of nescience is capable of creating a total confusion between the real and unreal. And, and I'm gonna look it up. I'm sure I looked it up the day I contemplated it because I don't know it. Um, so let me look it up real quick. Oh, did I spell it wrong or does my dictionary not know the word either? Oh my goodness, let me check my spelling. Or, or Anne, do you wanna just tell me what it means? My dictionary doesn't know the word. Somebody on mic can tell me what it means. I've got it up here on my phone. It says okay. lack of knowledge or awareness. Lack of, okay, lack of knowledge or awareness. Okay, would you believe my dictionary didn't even know that word? So I'm totally forgiven. Um, let's see. So 358. How do you spell it? It's like N-E and then science. Yeah, just N-E and then the word science, nescience. So the power of lack of awareness or lack of true knowledge is capable of creating a total confusion between the real and the unreal. Or, or a really simple way to say it is the power of ignorance, right? I think that would be fair. The power of ignorance is capable of creating a total confusion between the real and the unreal. Okay, now that that makes sense, let's go see in three minutes what I wrote in Out of the Stillness. It is time to be honest beyond the human definition of honesty. What is known, absolutely known from direct experience and what is believed, that is learned and adopted as truth. Do not abandon honesty. Let critical honesty answer this question continuously until the true answer is clear. So this says that the power of lack of knowledge, <laughs> right? The power of lack of knowledge is total confusion between what's real and unreal. And apparently I heard that. 
because my decision was to be honest beyond the de the human definition of honesty. And what I meant was I have to start defining for myself what I know, what I absolutely know, and what is just believed. And, you know, a great example of that is um, Jesus. How many of us know from our direct experience that a man named J Jesus of Nazareth, who died on a cross and was resurrected, ever existed? We don't. We, none of us know that. See, that's that's honesty beyond human honesty. Do you see the majority of what we think we know, we don't know, we believe. So at this point, after contemplating the power of lack of knowledge or the power of ignorance, being able to confuse you completely between what's real and what's unreal, what I decided is, okay, what I need to do now is get real clear on what I actually know and what I believe. And uh, I did begin to get really clear there. And in fact, um, I was probably writing True Discernment around this time. And this got written right into True Discernment. If you've taken True Discernment, there's a whole a whole week on it, right? But with that, I am out of time. So I'm going to leave you with that. Maybe just, you know, if you haven't done this yet, start paying attention. What's the difference between what you absolutely know? And you'll find that's very little <laughs> compared to what you believe and start cleaning a lot of clutter out really quickly that way okay next week the sanctuary is closed because it's the day before thanksgiving so i will see you all in two weeks all right